So good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Autism Training and Technical Assistance Project. Um, this is our monthly webinar for March, and we will be discussing an overview of legal rights and responsibilities for autistic students and potential employers. Um, I'm joined today by Lindsay uh, Shelton. I don't know how to pronounce Palak. Palak? I should have asked you. Palak, yeah. Palak. Okay, so Lindsay Palak Shelton. Um, and uh, she, I'll let her introduce herself here in a second. I'm just going to do some housekeeping items, some introductory things. Um, so thank you for spending your Tuesday morning with us. We do appreciate your time. Uh, you can go to the next slide for me, Lindsay, please. Um, my name is Kirsten Bayer, and I am with the LMA Center for Specialized Professional Support at LMA State University. Um, we are housed in the Educational Administration and Foundations Department, so I'll tell you a little bit more about our center here in a second. Um, I am the Digital Communications Manager for our center, um, and so I provide marketing and technical support um, and facilitation for all of our webinars and online professional development that we do. Um, and so I will be on today for technical support and to help Lindsay with facilitation of any questions or anything. So feel free to reach out to me via the chat um, or the Q&A if you have any questions or um, any follow-up things regarding this uh, webinar um, or the website or anything like that or anything about our autism and training and technical assistance project. Um, my email is up on the screen for you. You can go to the next slide for me, Lindsay, please. Um, so a little bit about our project, if you're not familiar with ADA, um, we develop and present resources that assist individuals with autism, specifically in the transition piece. So we are specifically focused on providing professional development resources and tools for all of our stakeholders, which is all of you, um, specifically focused on the transitional piece, um, either transitioning individuals with autism or autistic individuals, um, to from secondary to post-secondary or from secondary to employment, whatever that path looks like for that individual. Um, and so we work with our stakeholders, um, community members, um, secondary and post-secondary education, uh, family members, parents to provide that support and training um, to all of you and just create that equitable experience for all individuals on the spectrum. If you can go to the next slide for me, Lindsay, thank you. So a little bit about our center. So we are a grant funded center in the EAF department, Educational Administration and Foundations Department at Illinois State University in the College of Education. Um, again, our center creates and supports and delivers professional development for education professionals across Illinois. Um, we work with ISBE specifically on this project, so the Illinois State Board of Education. Um, and we also have a multitude of other projects um, that we work on and some that we collaborate with the ADA project on. Um, we provide technical assistance. We develop those resources, publications. We do focus groups um, and we work on program improvement strategies for all of our partners, specifically focusing on college transition, recruitment, retention, and completion. Um, so that's kind of where this project falls in right into our niche of work. Um, and we specifically focus on special population learners. Uh, we have been found, we were founded in 1977. So we've been at the university for a long time now. Um, and we, we love it here and we love the Ada project. It's very near and dear to our heart. Um, go on the next slide for me, Lindsay. So this is our website where you can find today's recording, um, as well as resources and all of the things about the Ada project. Um, it's kind of our one-stop shop. So it's the autism college and career.com. And I can put the hyperlink in the, in the chat here momentarily. Um, but again, this is our logo, ICSPS, that's our center's name. It is kind of a mouthful, um, but once you kind of get it down, you get it down. Um, and we also are funded, this project is funded by the LMA State Board of Education. So we work in collaboration with them and, and the special education department um, to put on this project and this work. You can go to the next slide for me, Lindsay. Um, so the First thing we're going to do today is just some beginning polls. So I'm going to launch those now. If you're familiar with our, our other project webinars, you probably are familiar with these polls. They're kind of for our reporting purposes, so we appreciate you taking the time to click through them. The first one is which region are you located in um, across the state or if you're statewide, if you're out of state joining us. And then the second poll, you can actually just scroll down 
is which ad a stakeholder you do you best represent? And that's a multiple choice question. So you can feel free to, if you consider yourself a uh, post-secondary educator, but you're also a family member of an individual with autism or autistic individual, then you can feel free to select um, a multitude of the second poll there. And kind of while you are answering those polls, I'm going to go over some housekeeping things. So today's session is being recorded. It's going to be up on our website. We do have closed captioning on, so feel free to turn that on for notes or for accessibility purposes. Um, our YouTube is fully closed captioned um, by a third party company, so it's accurate. Um, so editing the video does take about 48 working business hours. So um, bear with us, but the recording will be up within about 48 uh, business hours, so by Thursday morning, typically. And we'll have that up on the website. Tomorrow, you'll receive a follow-up email with a follow-up survey and the link to the website where the recording will be. Um, Lindsay has graciously already supplied us with um, her presentation from today. So I will have that for you, and I can put that in the chat here momentarily if you want to download it. Um, right away, but it's also already on our website as well. Um, and then we also are on Zoom webinar, not Zoom meeting. So you do not have the ability to unmute yourselves. We ask that you just post any questions or comments or concerns in the chat or the Q&A, and then we'll pause at the end of the session for Q&A time, and I'll help Lindsay facilitate um, those questions for the presentation. And Lindsay, you can go to the next slide if you want. And everybody's kind of finishing up the polls here. So I'll end that and share the results. It looks like most of you are joining us from Northwest Illinois and the Chicago region. Um, and then a lot of you are also, also stakeholder wise, a lot of you are secondary and post-secondary um, or students and young adults, um, a couple of community members and family members as well. So thank you for joining us. We do appreciate your time. So I'll end that. And then I will hand it off to Lindsay. I will be here the whole session though. So please feel free to reach out to me if you need anything. Cool. Okay, hi, good morning. Hi, uh, my name is Lindsay Palak Shelton. Um, and I am so happy that all of you signed up for this presentation this morning. Uh, when I was asked to speak on this topic, I was really excited because I think this is one area of special education and kind of transitioning into the world of work and employment and adult living that is very specific, but it's also not talked about a ton. Um, and the understanding is just a little vague with parents and certain stakeholders. So um, I'm excited to be here this morning um, and have this topic of conversation. We kind of carved out the last 30 minutes of any questions. Um, so feel free to put them in the chat box. I really enjoy discussion-based um, presentations. So um, feel free to go ahead and um, do that as we get going. Um, so we'll do some information for, for about an hour. And then um, if you're still here, then we'll do a Q&A at the end. Um, my agenda for today is just going over planning for employment, um, the, actually the legal rights and responsibilities of everyone, and then um, some tools for community members, because at this point we know the IEP team significantly grows um, when a student is going to be transitioning from either high school to employment or transition program to employment. Um, there's about 52 slides. I promise not to bore you a ton, um, but there are some really good links to some resources um, in here for both family stakeholders, um, including community members and businesses and um, professionals. So a little bit about me. Um, I was in the public school system for about 10 years. Uh, I started up my own transition consulting company um, about three, four, five years ago. And um, it really has always been such a passion of mine because this is what really matters. Um, I think it, it, there's just such a big difference between uh, curriculum teachers and content teachers versus this kind of population of educators that really are focusing on those soft skills and those employability skills to better the community around them. Um, I have been really lucky to be matched with a ton of professors that are deep into research over the years. Um, and I was really motivated to kind of get more involved with that piece of the research and the data that kind of drives best practice and programming at a state and a national level. Um, 
so with that being said, we had just recently uh, relaunched the state division of um, Illinois Division on Career Development and Transition. Um, if you're not familiar with that, I highly encourage you to check it out. Um, it is a incredible resource for educators and families and even community members um, about embedding all of that research and having all of these silos across the country kind of come together and get some really good ideas, um, support each other and um, model things that have been really successful over the years for um, student success and positive outcomes. So I highly encourage you to check that out. Um, so a little bit about me, I'm in the Northwest suburbs of, uh, Chicago. I'm based out of Inverness. Um, I have clients throughout the state. Um, I have some in various states, thanks to zoom. Um, and I specifically work with families and, um, some businesses, um, and some school districts on professional development and growth in all of those areas, um, community em employment, vocational site setup, monitoring, job coach training, all of that fun stuff. And I think this topic in particular, I have one autism specialist on staff who does um, small group activities, individual training, and it all gets so important as we move along. So this topic, again, has been super important to me. I also have an educational consultant on staff as well. Um, so less about me and more about you. Um, if you don't mind running the poll, um, I just kind of want to see, I know that the information before was helpful. Um, I usually like to know if there are any um, students with autism or um, parents of any children with autism in the groups. Um, I have been told my tone is pretty blunt. And so um, I think after 10 years of being in a public school system and also knowing what is available after they take their diploma has kind of allowed me to um, be pretty, pretty clear in what these outcomes look like and next steps for getting to get there. Um, so I think it's just really helpful to kind of know the audience that I'm speaking to just to make sure that I'm pretty clear about um, what the uh, agenda is. Okay, we're going to give everybody like five more seconds. We okay. have a couple more people who haven't answered. Thank you. And I love that there's mostly secondary educators here. That's great. Thank you. Okay, so I'm sharing the results now if you want to debrief. Okay, awesome. So we've got some parents. Um, special educators, related services. I love your related services people. You guys do like God's work. And um, especially when you're getting into this area, it's all those soft skills. It's so incredible. And transition specialist, higher ed, awesome. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right, so like I said before, if you're not familiar with DCDT, I'm gonna do a quick plug. Um, I highly encourage you to check it out. We have our annual conference coming up this fall up in Reno. Um, if you're looking to propose any presentations or poster sessions on the best practices that you're implementing in any of your programs at the high school transition program or at the college level, we're looking for um, a call for proposals right now. Um, if something's working, present it, right? Share it with other people. That's the best way that people can get motivated and take things back. I know that was the one of the first larger national conferences that I went to years ago. And I can't tell you how motivated I was to come back. You are overwhelmed, right? There's so much information, but bigger than that, I think that when something is so specific to what you do, these people just have so much data. And that really was the muscle that kind of improved a lot of programming where I was um, because of this organization. So if you're interested, please, you know, do not be shy, put out proposals. People want to know what you're doing across the country. Um, and if you're not familiar with DCDT, it's a sub branch of the International Organization of Council for Exceptional Children. Um, I'm also on the um, Illinois CEC State Board, and we also have a fall conference that um, talks about special education in general. We're having a significantly strong transition strand on the last day. We're having parents come in and we're having service providers come in. So again, if you're interested in staying local and presenting any of your work or networking with more people in the area, 
feel free to submit a proposal. If you're not a member and you want to be a member, here's your information. Here's a discount code. Um, we were just recently in um, Louisville. Um, super helpful, great data, great research to bring back to your um, districts. And if you're just interested in following along and seeing what we're doing, we have some social media. Okay, so planning for employment. This is one of my favorites. Um, sorry for the second poll. If you could just please uh, let me know when do you mostly have employment or community-based employment training start specifically with your students on the spectrum. That is really helpful for me um, to know as I kind of guide some of these discussions. I've certainly worked with school districts where they've kind of held off, right? Like pre-COVID all the time, it was like, well, we'll wait till their senior year. We'll wait till their last year. And then when COVID swung by, there wasn't a last year, right? So we had all these students taking all these academic classes for a long time. And then unfortunately what we had was students that had aged out and now we have unemployable adults with pretty minimal employment skills. So I think with that, or given that, you know, unpredictable scenario, Parents are becoming more educated. School districts are really beginning to have those front loading conversations much earlier um, and more frequently because, you know, as, even though we've extended the final year where students are allowed to stay, we're still being able to kind of incorporate those employability skills and that training early and often. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, cool. We got 16, 17, a big chunk on 18. And I'm glad it's not 2021 20, and 22. That would break my little heart. Okay, so that is great to know. Um, where we're kind of starting with this is, you know, why, why are we even talking about this, right? Why on earth are we even having these discussions about planning for employment, right? It's part of the IEP. We talk about it, we write about it. You know, we have to have these discussions with parents, but the reason why, right, is we have indicator 14, right? And we need to know where these students are going or have a better um, roadmap or a clearer picture of how we can put some supports in place and programming in place in order for them to get where they need to go. Um, and I know you've sat around these um, meetings and have tried to encourage families to um, see best practice and look at programming holistically. And I just think that there's a lot of um, dialogue that goes into it, right? And there's just a ton of information and front loading with families and parents to buy into what this is, because what we're showing time and time again through indicator 14 is that the outcomes are certainly not positive. And, um, you know, when I work with some school districts, they're like, I don't even know what indicator 14 is. And not necessarily the transition staff, it's more the content teachers, right? Like maybe you're teaching special education English or something, and you're kind of not worried about these phone calls that are happening later saying, are they employed? Are they living on their own? Are they going to school? All of that data that's helping programming drive positive outcomes really is kind of like a clerical task and maybe like a state mandated reporting thing, but it really um, within the transition field is where it's coming from, right? If we're trying to have a data-driven way of creating and providing these post-secondary outcomes that are positive, we have to see where we're at. So again, we're looking at employment, independent living, and we're looking at our education piece. And specifically with students with autism, right? I feel like, you know, we're really honing in on that academic piece and certainly not the entire spectrum of students on the spectrum, right? But I would say when I talk to educators or administrators, we're really trying to do little doses of employment throughout school, right? Because there's so many electives and there's so many things and these AP classes and, you know, certainly different fit for each student, but there's only so much time in the day, right? And I think that's where students and teachers get to the end of every semester. Like, oh, well, we can't put it in this class or we can't do the employment piece because it's two classes, you know? So that's part of the struggle. So I digress. So we're looking at indicator 14. And unfortunately, the numbers are just really, really terrible. I mean, the state is saying within this time frame between, you know, 2024 to 2025, we're only expecting 
65% of individuals with disabilities. And this is across categories. And I think, you know, this is just on the ISBE website, right? Like this isn't hidden information. ISBE is saying that you're doing kind of a good job if only 63-ish percent of your students have paid employment within two years post-graduation. Like, and I use this example all the time. If my car only works 63% of the time, I would be livid, right? How frustrating is that to work years and years and years? And the whole goal is to be an employable member of society, right? So those numbers just should really, really hit hard with families. And I think even front-loading them with that information at the beginning also just kind of plants the seed of like, okay, like, you know, maybe we should hold off on the academics, certainly not all, but having those harder discussions of, okay, if this is where the expectation is, no wonder there's a real difficulty of continuation of services post high school, right? Like if this is the standard 63%, um, you know, and then it bumps up to 66% in 2025, but okay. So this is on the website and this is what we're working with, right? This is why it's so important that we're working backwards. And again, this is just a graph. I mean, this is just something that I always show parents, you know, the intent of all of this, the intent of all of this information through ISBE in the IEP is solely education-based. Like none of this has to do with um, employment laws. None of this has to do anything. This has absolutely everything to do with, um, you know, idea and special education. So we're going to kind of go into like the legislation and the laws and the policies and everything that are supplementing the fact that these numbers are so low and quite honestly, pretty inappropriate for these students that were embedding all of this curriculum and rigor and exposure to community settings to impact these positive outcomes for students specifically on the spectrum. So we'll kind of go into major, major federal reform information, but um, a lot of this, there was a huge longitudinal study and they talked about students with all disabilities and they really honed in on students with autism. And we'll kind of go into that a little bit, but I mean, these numbers should frustrate anyone, right? Like if this is the expectation compared to anyone with a non-disability, there's no wonder that we're making these phone calls and people have no idea about competitive employment or really any, com any, comp any employment post high school. Um, there was an incredible uh, article through NPR talking about the um, increase of organizations in the autism world supporting individuals with autism getting employment based on how low these numbers are. But the graph is just showing you two years out of high school, right? Those are the employed people, right? Around like 60-ish percent. Two to four years out, it drops significantly. And every single year post high school, competitive, I'm just going to use that as like the general term, paid employment drops significantly, right? And you think about that distance from high school, right? Like that person that graduated 10 years ago is not ruffling around for a piece of paper, looking for their summary of performance paperwork to contact their DRS rep, which by the way, is probably not employed there anymore, right? So we're really trying to make sure that as they're leaving, as we're having these discussions, they have a pretty clear picture of what this future can look like and why we're implementing these things right now. Um, I, again, I'm totally geek out about all of the data-driven information. So the taxonomy for transition planning is so critical. And I share this with families and schools and specifically businesses all the time because it is such a cycle of informed information that drives programming, drives planning based on the outcomes. And, you know, we've all sat at a table where, um, you know, ideas are thrown out and we really want the data. Like, where did we collect that? Why are we saying the student can only do X, Y, and Z? Or why are we saying that this job site is not available? Why are we saying they can only go out to the community one hour a week, right? And I think this is a really strong muscle to use with school districts and departments when you're trying to validate bridging the gap to employment, right? Because we are, I specifically look at the student development, right? Like we talk about self-determination, we talk about the IEP process and like those things that, those are certainly things that can take place early on, right? Like when I work with elementary schools or I have clients that are really young or, you know, we're really talking about that, um, 
understanding what my skills are, understanding what I'm good at. And that can be done early and often. But then as we get to the student development part, and we're talking about employability skills, we're talking about work experience, we're talking about support services, you know, we're not even really talking a ton about um, VR services at this point. We're just talking about um, informed information as people are moving forward, especially families. Um, and I really hone in on that student development piece because those are things that can be implemented at the school with the bridge of the community. Um, and it's so big, right? You know, then you're talking about businesses and chambers of commerce and really trying to do things the specific way. So we'll kind of get into those legal pieces of it. But again, we're always going back to how are we going to start bridging what we can offer here under the constraints that we have with idea and special education in the K through 22 system, and then also start branching into the world of employment, which is the ultimate goal. So again, you know, we start looking at what some of these barriers, barriers are for employment, okay? And a lot of it is, you know, really not something we're thinking about. So one of my favorite things is everyone will talk about the services cliff, right? Especially for students with autism. You know, we've given all these supports, all of these padded services, all of this information prior to graduation, whether they leave after their senior year or they're gonna continue on in a transition program, there is a cliff, there certainly is. Like, I don't think anyone in Illinois, which, you know, I always add this as like a pretty terrible stat, but like Illinois continues to be number 51 in the entire country for adult services with any disability post high school. So knowing that going into it, is not a shock that there's going to be services clip, right? There's a really hard continuum of services for students. There just is. There just really isn't a ton of handholding. So that's an enormous barrier, right? You have a student that just may or may not continue with services, think they can go off to college, think they can get a job on their own. And there's such research saying that the further they are from graduation, they're not calling that DRS office. They're not reaching out to any other autism specifically organization for that assistance, right? A lot of people view the disability piece as IEP and we're gonna leave that in high school, which is really unfortunate, right? So like, I kind of always describe this with me, like I'm a procrastinator, enormous procrastinator. That doesn't change, right? Like my consequences do, but it's always going to manifest itself in a strange way, but it's never gonna go away. It's all those strategies that you have in place. Um, another barrier to employment is the self-identification. Um, I don't know how frequent it is, but I've heard many, many times from many, many staff and even administrators, while students are in the K through 12 system, it's a real challenge because, you know, you're looking at guardianship, and you're looking at working with a student. And unfortunately in schools at that time, parents really have a ton of direction with what students are able to know. So I've worked with plenty of families where they don't want their son or daughter to know that they have autism. And it's a real tricky, tricky scenario, right? Because, um, you know, they may be mainstreamed, they may be in AP classes, you know, they may be in full instructional programming, you know, there's a variety of it, but schools are kind of it, you know, they have to meet that need or request of the parent. So, you know, then you're looking into these services post high school when these students can't even identify or articulate what that is, which is huge. You know, I've listened to plenty of podcasts and talked to plenty of adults with disabilities, specifically autism. And they say it was such a detriment that families did not share that information. They always felt like they had some thing that they were missing or some label that they needed. And to have that taken away from them was a huge piece of identity. So it's more frequent than I would like to admit, it, and it is. Um, you know, there's a ton of community misinformation, you know, unfortunately, when we think of people with autism, we're like, oh, put them in a tech thing, put them behind computers. Well, that's not always the case, right? You know, I've met great 
professors on the spectrum. I have met great public speakers on the spectrum. I have met um, owners of businesses on the spectrum. You know, it just is not always the same. And I think sometimes community just thinks that this site or this employment piece is not really good for them because of their diagnosis. Um, and so unfortunately that's just kind of how it is, or, you know, the old scenario of somebody bagging groceries, like we're over it. Right. I mean, it's just been told and told time and time again. And so when businesses may connect or may start opening their doors up, that's all they know. And why should they, unless they have some type of personal connection, family experience, you know, they don't know. And unfortunately, while students are still in the public school system, it's our responsibility to inform community, inform businesses. You know, it's like you go to college and you have no idea like how broad this is, right? But that's the point, right? It has to come from the schools because of all these other legal things that we'll get into. Um, tons of social obstacles, right? You go to work every day, you know, you have to deal with the grumpy coworker or, you know, just your car breaks down on the way. How do you manage that? There's just certain things that we don't think about are in this box of what a certain job um, uh, task is or what a certain job title is. And there's so many other things around it. So another thing is the big job descriptions, right? They may say they're looking for X, Y, and Z, but unfortunately job descriptions are not always super transparent, right? So you have all of this information that is not very easy to interpret and read and then move forward for steps. Um, and then the last one is just interviewing process, right? Some people just are not good interviewers and there's that social piece. There's the eye contact, there's the reading social cues, there's, you know, knowing what to do, how to respond, being too blunt, you know, all of those standard quirks of autism, right? That people maybe know that's how they come across. And unfortunately, if a, um, interviewer is just not aware of it, it just kicks them out of the population of their employee pool, which is really unfortunate. So, you know, take all these other VR things, take all of these other, um, you know, supported um, services post high school, like this is just what it is, right? Most students with disabilities, specifically autism, just have this area that they're up against prior to even getting your foot in the door for any vocational experience. Okay, so, you know, when we think about vocational training and employment, very little is written into the IEP about experience, right? And the goal is written, you know, like Tim wants to go into computer science and become a code something, right? Like there was always a computer thing, right? Mostly. And, um, the schedules are booked with electives, right? So as we're talking about what this eventual goal is, mostly for students with autism, very little is there practical community-based vocational training written or embedded into the schedule or the day, right? Or if we start talking about it, it could be like, oh, well, next year they're gonna follow this or next year we're gonna get into it. And unfortunately, it kind of starts getting busier with classes, right? So we're learning all the content, which is great. But if we continue to have three more years of high school content, four more years of college content, where are we practicing all these skills where we know data is showing us they need thousands and thousands and thousands of experiences for generalizing skills and um, all of the soft skills that we're saying are leading our students with autism to become un unemployable. So, you know, if we have that hat and be able to use that time to focus on any of that stuff while we're planning for employment, the better. And we all know we're in these meetings and, you know, unless it's being talked about outside of the IEP meeting, there's just so much to discuss at the table. So having those discussions early and often about what and how we can embed these vocational and transition opportunities into their day makes more sense, right? Because if you have 50 minutes, if you have an hour with a family, we're talking about class updates, we're talking about a report that was already sent home. So, you know, and I say that very bluntly, because the more it's talked about throughout the year, there's less of like a gotcha, right? Like we find this to be very beneficial. We're working on these skills. This is how we have to do it moving forward. 
All right, so legal rights and responsibilities. Um, and I always start this with, you know, there is a ton of information on special education, right? There's tons of conferences on special education and idea and all of these things in order to protect students in order to get um, their educational um, needs met in a school. And it's really tricky when we start talking about meeting a lot of these needs as they go out into the community. And so you're not gonna Google like ISBE and find any of this, right? It's all on these fringe um, regulations and uh, guidelines and federal laws that are gonna tell you how to implement this and what they should be able to do in order to protect them. So, you know, all of these are slow, legislation that is kind of leading to how we perform this vocational training for students with autism out in the community. And, you know, the Americans with Disability Act classifies autism as the disability, right? And it is going to tell them that they have to have opportunities um, to be able to provide these vocational and employment options out in the community. You know, little does it say that, you know, you can't discriminate, but there's just so many soft ways that people are discriminating. So again, it kind of comes from us in terms of how we're going to be able to support them. Um, the Department of Labor, if you're not familiar with it, is the biggest muscle in all of this, right? I think when IEP teams are starting to uh, try out some vocational training out in the community. There has just been a long history of um, people in the community participating out of kindness and courtesy um, and very little out of um, best practice, uh, positive outcomes, um, and really research. So when we start partnering with school districts or partnering with businesses in the communities or even informing families, you know, it's not because you think they need to go there five days a week. It's because the Fair Labor Standards Act is establishing that there's a minimum wage and it protects you, right? So anyone working at the Fair, Fair Labor Standards Act, that's that's your jam, right? That's how it protects you and gives you access to be able to set parameters in terms of going out into the community and working with businesses. So part of the Department of Labor's Fair Standard Labor Act is there's a little piece in there. And what it's gonna do is anytime you're setting up a program or anytime you're gonna be working with families, it gives you so much information, right? It's not just we're going to try this out. Is This is the policy. This is how we're finding it. And this is how we can legally do this out in the community. And the best part about this little clause in there is it gives you a roadmap to community-based learning, right? It tells you what you can do, how often, how frequently, and the constraints of supervision and liability and um, guidance. So, and then when you're going to these businesses, it gives you all the street cred, right? It's not just me being like, hey, I think they should go into your business and they can easily say no, but I have this research-based regulation that's telling me this is best practice and this is how I'm going to benefit, student's going to benefit, your business is going to benefit. Um, it protects the employer, it protects the student and mostly empowers the student, right? And then it has clear best practices, right? If before it was like, oh, my, my uncle is like the owner of this, or my neighbor is the manager down the street, and maybe they'll let us in. We're kind of done with the courtesy thing, right? Like as professionals, as people that, you know, do this as a career, we're kind of done with it. So this really uses the muscle of, you know, we're legitimizing this program. It adds credibility. The employers are going to trust this documentation. They're going to support, um, uh, it's going to justify why their support to help them and to make them uh, aware of all of the liabilities. Um, it helps them inform their hourly workers. It um, adds accountability. It aligns it with the IEP. So this is kind of like that bridge between the IEP and Department of Labor laws the FSLA, um, you know, and it then it goes into the best practices, right? Informing the parents, making sure that the community-based learning is inclusionary, um, and then working on those daily soft skills and using that placement to kind of have it as an extension of the classroom. So 
there's a benefit, right? To all this community-based learning, right? You have your employer benefits and mostly your student benefits. Um, your student is going to be providing services to the business. And this is where it gets a little like muddy, right? So we talk about that they're gonna be performing tasks that benefit the employer, but it may also be tasks that may not be benefiting the employer, right? So if we have our vocational coordinator, if we have somebody going into a business, we've got crazy lenses, right? Like if we ever approach a business and we're like, oh, do you have any tasks available? What's their first answer? No, of course there's no, because they don't look at it in terms of job carving or customized employment. Like we've got these, like, that's a great task. That's a great transferable skill. So we go in there and figure it out. And we're trying to pair that with the skill deficit that we're working with, with the students with autism, right? So then on top of it, we have the student benefit and the student really needs to outweigh the business personally. So they're gonna be performing all of these tasks that are based on their IEP needs, based on FF, FLSA, and then they are gonna be benefiting the employer. But you know, there's kind of some semantics around what that primary looks like. When you're discussing it with potential job sites, you know, we have to be very clear. It's an extension of the classroom. We're working on educational experience, all that fun stuff. So, you know, I've worked with businesses and families and schools in the past, and, you know, they're like, this is great. You know, they're performing great. I would love for them to come in on a day they typically don't do and help with the um, event that we have. And the answer is clear no, right? Unless you're going to pay them, we're not going to be sending them in. So the student is the first protector or protectant, and then we go out to the businesses. So for the community-based, what's well, community-based vocational instruction or community-based training experience or community-based, you know, vocational training, or, you know, it goes all over. It cannot exceed 120 hours per year. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and it's that number protects the student. It protects the business. And quite honestly, it helps you shell out businesses that are just kind of using you and using your students with disability. And that's the number one thing that we need to be protecting. So, you know, I've had students in the past where um, families had suggested they be somewhere and they were just there forever. And it was totally inappropriate. Um, and we'd get the job of Al's and they were kind of the same, the same. And I'm like, you know what? Like we need to add a part to this that says like, based on their current vocational experience or display of skills, would you hire them right now? And they didn't like that. They didn't like that at all because you want to know why they would check no, because they know they're not doing what they need to do, but they're an extra set of hands, which is totally inappropriate. But if we would say no, or if they would say yes, then they have to hire them, right? So there's this kind of push and pull of like, why are we staying here? What is the skill that we're working on? And what is the benefit to the student, right? Of course, there's a benefit to the place that we're doing the community-based vocational training, but how are we protecting the student and what benefit do they have at that point? Um, so, and it's kind of broken down, you know, there's kind of like, five hours per job experience for vocational exploration. And then, you know, there's like assessment, which is 90 hours, but then vocational training in general is like 120 hours. And I put the link down there um, that gives you <clears throat> direction to like an entire CBBI manual um, just to really comb through it. Because I remember when I was getting my certification for this, um, there's a lot, there's just a lot. And for the reason of protecting the students, <clears throat> excuse me, But there's so much that goes along with it, right? When you're going in and protecting the student, you also want to protect the business. And who do they have to report to, right? They're hourly workers. So there's a ton of information in there in terms of like, you can't displace any of their currently paid employees. They have to be supervised at all times by school staff or, you know, employer staff, but that's different with like on the job training and evaluation and stuff. So that's later down the road, but we're talking about setting up opportunities for students. Um, it specifically outlines the time spent at a site for a student in their IEP, you know, where sometimes I work with students um, and families is when there's like really nothing written into the IEP about what's occurring and maybe like the curriculum of a class. The curriculum of a class might be they participate in this, but there's nothing kind of bridging the gap of what the need is in the IEP and how 
we're formally doing this here. So there's the four pieces of vocational um, training. It's vocational exploration, vocational assessment, vocational training, and cooperative education. So, you know, the way that I think about vocational exploration is just kind of figuring out what you like. The assessment is, you know, actually completing some rigor of assessment to figure it out. And then the training is participating. Mm -hmm. And then the cooperative ed is your day, right? Like that is what it is. Um, filling out a self-reporting informal assessment is not really cooperative vocational education. That's scheduled into your day. Um, and again, a lot of this is rule of thumb. So if we have a max of 120 hours, which I think I could do the math, the math out of like eight or nine months a year, it's like 13 hours a week. Okay. Which is not much. And I'm not even factoring in like winter break and stuff. So we're kind of getting to like, yeah, we should put them at this business site for like five hours a day. It's just, it's, it's bananas, right? You're really looking at the need of the student, then looking at skill development out in the community, but you're really protecting the student. Um, okay. I know that's a lot of information about the rules and regulations, but my biggest takeaway from all of that is the fact that the laws and regulations are set up outside of special education. <clears throat> and as the expert in transition or voc ed, we're trying to use things that are outside of the school to support students as they meet their educational goals because it's an extension of the classroom. So some of the resources, and I always add this to mostly every single slide that I do or every presentation that I do. If you're not familiar with Dr. Jennifer Bumble, she is brilliant. Um, her resources are totally data-driven. And I share this with families in some schools too, but mostly families, um, because a lot of the ownership on behalf of parents goes to the schools, which is great as it should, right? However, as we're scaling back services, as we're looking for post-secondary options and services and placements, there's less special ed people in the world, unfortunately. That's just how it rolls. So, you know, you may not have a placement from eight to five every day, okay? Unless you're a teacher or have a, you know, a nine to five job, most people aren't doing the same thing, everything, every day. So we're piecemealing schedules together and we're piecemealing um, service providers through people that are in their world. Um, if you're not familiar with um, so, uh, Illinois microboards, check out microboards. It is incredible. Um, it's a way of uh, people providing their own um, natural supports in their world and supporting a person with um, any type of disability in particular, but I've had plenty of clients that have used it with its um, autism diagnosis. Um, and you can tell, right, if you look at, at the school, dis, school system versus beyond the school system, it's significantly bigger as it should be, right? Um, you know, I, unfortunately, schools come with such great support as they should. Those are the experts and that's, you know, your time limited spot. And I think I've just always had the hat of, that is a fraction of time, that is fantastic. But what's gonna happen is the 22 to 80, right? How are we living in the world? How are we using our resources? How are we becoming productive members of society? How are we getting paid, right? How are we minimizing um, unemployment? How are we accessing our environment around us? And so, you know, there's all of these things that are beyond the school system that are um, so much bigger than the SOP paperwork, right? I mean, that's the school's obligation. And we talk about, you know, your ISCs and we talk about all of these organizations, but beyond that, it's bigger than special ed. So, you know, this is just something that I throw out there because I really appreciate when families kind of have the light bulb of, I can't count on an organization. I can't count on one service. And we have to be thoughtful and creative about what this looks like. Um, I can go on a tangent on this forever, but, you know, I always ask people like, how long is your commute? And they're like, oh, God, it was like an hour. I commute from the city or something. And it's so funny how that um, mindset changes for students with disabilities. You know, it may be a 20 minute drive. It may be a 30 minute drive and families, you know, for a variety of reasons, right? Transportation is an enormous barrier to employment. Um, 
you know, but then we need to be creative and start thinking of safe transportation options. But my point of that being is not everything is going to be in your school community the way that it has been for 22 years. And so I think that is a significant stress on families, on community members, and schools are fantastic. However, great change comes from community and parents that go to their, you know, um, governing offices and talk about the need of what their community members are. You know, we can only do so much of an IEP. However, it's those bigger pieces. And I love seeing how um, transportation has improved over the years in certain areas um, because there's been these tax paying stakeholders that are making the change. So again, I use this example is just, this is probably one of my favorite things to do. Um, when we're working with partnering with businesses out in the community or when we're looking to set up potential job sites for students, I kind of use these as a, um, if you're not familiar with the job accommodation network, I highly encourage um, families and students and students certainly to get into this because it has a ton of information on there about how to prep for the world of work um, using accommodations. And one of the biggest pieces that I get from employers is I just don't know how to accommodate or I just don't, I don't know what they need. And the reality is, is you're looking at the statistics, many accommodations for students on the spectrum are significantly tiny. I mean, there's tiny, there's nothing. It's like, maybe the instructions written down, maybe I need an informal break every 20 minutes. And again, totally depends on candidate or student participating in the vocational based training, but it's pretty insignificant. And I think what's so overwhelming is just the diagnosis and what comes with it, right? We've got a bus, we have job coaches, we have a vocational, like there's a lot, right? And if you're not in that world, it's really overwhelming, especially when you come from a business mindset. So we talk about interviewing, we talk about disclosure, um, and that is a huge thing, right? Even if students aren't necessarily going to be participating in community-based vocational training, this is something that can happen early, early with students, right? Um, when I work with families, they're like, well, I don't want them to tell, right? Like they don't need to tell their employer. They certainly don't. Um, but you can certainly say, I have a condition where I need to take standing breaks every 15 minutes that's pretty doable, right? You don't have to shell out your grades. You don't have to shell out your recent testing from three years ago. You don't have to shell anything, right? A lot of the stuff that is confidential does not need to be shared at all. So a lot of this stuff kind of um, starts the bigger conversation that's very overwhelming for people to make it more manageable. Again, accommodation, knowledge, really informing employers of what that looks like, because nine times out of 10, they have no idea. Um, when we set up job sites with um, community businesses, we usually have some type of like total Q&A, right? Like I want businesses, if they've had no experience or if they have had experience with people with disabilities, to have that transparent conversation of like, do I have to hire them? what do I expect? Can I ask them to redo something? And like, you certainly can. That's the whole point. That's that taking in feedback. That's that it's, there's so much. And I think once that light bulb goes off for them, your job as the person setting up that job site and legitimizing community-based instruction for your student with autism is incredible. Um, and the other part is the knowledge, right? Like informing them, like we can do X, Y, and Z. And you can't expect us to do, you know, A, B, and C. That's just not what you're expected to do. Um, you know, the job coach isn't going to be participating in the job. And we're all helpers, right? That's where a lot of this is really challenging is we are in this because, A, we love what we're doing. We love helping. But then you get into that Department of Labor part and, like, you can't help a task move along, right? They can be done with something and not complete a task by the time the bus picks them up. And that's fine, right? It's just skill development. So, um, and I think that's also where it's helpful where you change job sites often, right? You're not meeting the needs and highly benefiting the employer to the fact that they don't need to hire or rehire any of their um current vacant positions, right? So it's just a ton of that prep. Um, many of the times when I work with students with autism, they um, wanna overshare, right? Like just so much oversharing. Um, and that's really challenging to work with too. I would say all the businesses that I work with, um, 
our connection is incredible. You know, we do mock interviews, we practice, we get questions ahead of time, we practice, um, we do separate, maybe small group interviews if one-on-one -on -one is overwhelming, you know, but again, it goes to that front loading with information, legitimizing your program, and really letting them know these are the students that are going to be coming in for this type of programming. Because once they get to VR, that's a whole other thing. And it certainly can happen together. Um, but this is just a really good way, especially if you're working with those 16 year olds, 17 year olds, and it's really not a big part of their day or week. Um, a lot of that goes a long way when maybe a student really is doing total academics for four years, and then they're in a transition program. And that is a huge leap, right? You're doing a ton of community-based instruction, um, very different from the academic day. So um, talking about this stuff early and often is helpful. And quite honestly, it just gives your students a ton of confidence, right? No one likes going into something blindly um, and letting them know that all of this is in place to protect them. And it's just not something they need to do to check off their list is really, really helpful. So just a few tools as we finish up, you know, we have the employer uh, or disability employment TA center, great resources for re um, community members and the stakeholders job accommodation network has fantastic resources in terms of minimal accommodations. How do I interview? How do I talk about disclosure? How do I talk about interviewing? Um, what are some autism specific organizations that truly have like job boards, right? That's another thing. Even if you're not going out into the community and you have a student resource or you have a student that's all into this, um, they could easily be looking at this stuff from any of their areas. Um, WorkNet is incredible. I suggest all of my clients work with Illinois WorkNet. Um, there are assessments, there are trends for employment, uh, light, bright outcomes, uh, salary information. Um, I do a ton of triangulation of IEP goals through this because you're pulling Department of Labor standards. You're tying that with skill defi deficit areas and you're um, combining that in an IEP. And you, now you have a whole IEP written for goals that are specific to what they want to do in the future. Um, super helpful for related services, for um, any of your combining academic and transition goals. Highly suggest checking that out. Um, if you're not familiar with NTACT, um, it's the broader scope of what used to be like transition coalition, um, tons of resources in terms of employment and autism. Um, I usually just have this in a tab and check it out every once in a while. Great resources, great newsletter. And again, ONET um, kind of goes in with WorkNet as well. Great resource for families. Um, and here I had the disability employment policy from um, Department of Labor. Um, there is an entire thing on the Department of Labor's website about employing individuals with autism, organizations that work with individuals with autism. Um, and it's a good starting point, certainly for families to start recognizing that this information is post the walls of the high school. Um, and it really takes away that I'm thinking you can't do this. And it's, this is the standards of Department of Labor. These are the expectations of the job. It's not this mean employer saying, you know, you could really improve on this, this, and this. It really is taking that and putting that into what it is, right? When we're looking at all these employment initiatives. Um, there's some policy information. I have it linked in here later, but there's a bunch of information that just needs to go along with documentation for participating in community-based um, vocational training. You know, we talk about uh, liability and supervision. It just outlines who is going to be responsible. It talks about um, the extension of the classroom um, and monitoring of the students out in the community. That's always a big thing with the businesses and certainly the families, which is totally understandable. Um, but all of this, if written out well, if rolled out well, if front loading is super beneficial for the students. Um, you know, we talk about training. Why do we need to notify any of the um, uh, job coaches, right? Why do we need to inform the hourly workers at the employment site? Well, because how many times have you been with a site or have heard of a site and they've shut down because their unions were getting really uncomfortable with the fact that these students were coming in, not getting paid at all, and in their mind, taking away job responsibilities? A lot. It happens very frequently. And 
but then there hasn't been those transparent discussions of like, you're just a really bad employee. Like you're just always showing up late, right? So it's just legitimizing the program and making sure that your students are protected to complete that extension of the classroom experience out in the community. Um, this is an, another one that I really use a ton. It's the community-based community -based vocational exploration learning piece. I have the link in here for it through the Council for Exceptional Children through DCDT. Their fast facts are amazing. If you become a member, you get access to all this. Um, but it really talks about everything that we've talked about today in terms of protecting the student, why we're implementing it, and really what that gap is between the IEP, which really has nothing to do with like, you know, life post high school, um, to be blunt, but it really outlines what that looks like and the research backing why this is so important. Um, and just be honest, you know, be honest with the employers, honest with the students. Um, you know, this isn't something that we're punishing them for. This is an experience, right? And one thing that I always share with employers is how great would that be to train your future workforce? How great would that be to know that you have somebody coming in that knows what you need to do, right? That's cutting money from their training budget. That's cutting money from um, unemployment in the future. You know, there's so many benefits of it, which is a whole other webinar about all those things. Um, but really explaining that this is to benefit everyone and it's to practice what you like and don't like, you know, and if they don't like it, that's great feedback too, you know? Um, I break down the four employment areas um, and all of this discussion is based on all of these. Now, the fourth one, sheltered employment, falling by the wayside, certainly, but unfortunately it's still considered in some of the data research. Um, but when we're talking about competitive employment, I'm not talking about 40 hours a week benefits. I'm talking about full pay, not minimal, not subsidized through um, an organization. Um, so I have that linked there just to kind of have the breakdown of the four subcategories. And that's all I got. But truly, there's so much about all of this. Um, and I can go on forever about it. But I hope the takeaway was um, there's legitimate practices that are protecting the student, um, protecting the schools, and certainly protecting the employers. If you're either looking for a new site or um, trying to encourage families for students to participate participate in these earlier in their high school experience. Um, I've met really no parents that have been like, oh, that was a really bad idea that we started working on getting them employed earlier than often. All the feedback that I get from families is, I wish we started it earlier, or I wish we had this information earlier. Um, you know, and whatever with COVID, right? But we cannot predict another crazy experience where we're going to be shutting down or minimizing exposure to community opportunities um, that are really kind of not even outlined in an IEP. So um, that is my takeaway with that. Early and often is great. Protect the student and um, you're just going to have great results. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. I'm happy to um, discuss. I um, have time for questions if anyone has any. If not, thank you for participating and listening to me jabber for an hour. I appreciate it. Um, I have my contact information um, listed here if you would prefer to email later. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I can't hear you. Are you able to hear me now? There we go. Okay. Sorry, everybody. A <laughs> uh, little issue with my headphones there. Um, so thank you so much, Lindsay. We appreciate it. We did have one question in the chat um, from Lori. This is, what is the max number of hours community-based learning cannot exceed? 120. 120. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. And I think one of the slides has all of um, how it's outlined and it's linked to the Department of Labor. Um, and what I always say to school districts and families is like, 
they're never going to be like snooping around and be like, show me this kid's IEP, right? Because those are confidential and you can't do it. Where it becomes an issue is when you're not front loading transparency with employees and they file a complaint with the employer and then the Department of Labor comes in. And if it's not documented or if the hours are not written into it, then that's when it becomes problematic. Um, and then we have another question. Do you have any suggested assessments or checklists for employers to use to evaluate student performance? Ooh. So I ask them to use the employee checklist that they have on file for their employees. Um, most of the schools that I work with, I ask them to do that because it gives you real feedback um, in terms of what that looks like. And then on top of it, what it does <laughs> is that, I mean, some schools will take it and they'll do their combination of what that looks like. Um, or we incorporate some of their IEP goals, right? That's what is driving all this, right? So we incorporate a checklist of what their IEP goals and then you know their employer can evaluate what that looks like in terms of that skill deficit, whether it's the socialization piece or the task management, um, any of that. But usually districts or schools or um, job coaches will create their own. Um, but I say go off of what the employers are typically looking for um, because that's, the whole point of it. And if you go to that um, uh, ONET and, you know, let's say somebody, um, and I'm using like the standard, but let's say somebody is doing bookkeeping at a clerical office. Um, if you type in bookkeeping, it'll write every single task or every single um, uh, skill required for that. And then people will pull what those are and then they can evaluate at that point. But that's where a lot of schools in the past have been like, we just kind of created our own and you know, it was totally fine. And then parents are like, well, show me the data. Like where are they not miss or where are they missing the mark and why aren't they employing them now? Like if they've been there a year and they're saying they're doing great, why aren't we moving on with our goals? So then we use the third, you know, I of, well, it's not us, it's the Department of Labor and this is bookkeeping and they're completing A, B, C, not D, E, F. Good question. Um, Jessica, who asked that question says, thank you. We have been using mynextmove.org mm -hmm. skills slash tasks due to being a very rural setting with many mom and pop shops opening their doors to us. Yeah. And we love those, right? The mom and pops. It's like, you know, I always say start small, right? Where it gets to be a little tricky is like just that courtesy, right? You know, it's like, but this is why we're setting this up, right? And, you know, maybe I've got this checklist or something that I created, but, you know, this is the industry standard and this is what these tasks are requiring. Um, but I mean, truly, most students are getting it through mom and pop shops. And that's where you're going to find a ton of that flexibility um, where, you know, I was like, go to Target, go to, you know, and there's just so much red tape. Um, but that's where those personal connections and that networking comes in because, you um, more than them liking you. Now you have a standardized um, policy that's larger than you and knowing that it's not courtesy and this, these are parameters that are gonna protect them um, totally legitimizes their uh, liability for you being in their sites. Awesome, okay. So I don't see any other questions coming through, but we'll give it another minute. Um, I'm going to do just a couple closing housekeeping items. So like I said at the beginning of the webinar, today's session was recorded. Um, we will have that up on our website within about 48 hours. The presentation was put in the chat um, at the beginning of the session, and then it is also up on our website already, um, Lindsay's presentation that you see here. So if you want any information um, I know she has a lot of links in here, like even just her email or her website or um, the link to some of the conferences she shared at the beginning. If you want any of those, you can download the presentation and then that has all the links in it. Um, I'm also putting in the chat right now a follow-up survey. Um, so I know whenever I watch a webinar, I'm not going to take a follow-up survey unless it's like right after I watch it because I you know, don't want to take the time to do it tomorrow or whatever. So um, I always put those in the chat towards the end of our webinars. So feel free to go ahead and take that follow-up survey for us. We really appreciate it. If there's any topics that you want on the Ada Professional Development 
um, we are more than happy to um, like take suggestions. Uh, we have a whole committee that helps us plan PD for the year. So we love when uh, we hear directly from you, our stakeholders, about what you want professional development on. And then we take that and kind of run with it. Um, so feel free to put that on any of our surveys and then also give Lindsay and this presentation some feedback as well. Um, we also, um, thank you, Lindsay. We also, um, uh, I have lost my train of thought because she just chatted me. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me put our website in the chat here for you as well. And all of this information, the, the survey for today, the website, um, where the recording is and the presentation, everything will all be in your follow-up email tomorrow. So if you have another meeting you need to run to, um, feel free to just access that stuff in the follow-up email. And I think that's pretty much it. Cool. Nobody else. Thank you for you? joining me this morning. This was great. I could go on forever. So thanks for listening to me uh, talk away. Yeah, thank you so much, Lindsay. We really appreciate you um, joining us and providing this session today. Uh, we know it's important information and it's an important project. And so we were excited to collaborate with you for both of our, our, our center and your uh, business. Thanks. Okay, I don't think anybody else has any other questions. I don't see any coming through. So thank you for joining us this morning. We appreciate your time. Um, have a great rest of your Tuesday and we will see you next month for our um, autism training and technical assistance project April webinar. Just a quick plug for that one. We are going to have a panel session. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Um, if you're not signed up for our marketing emails, hopefully you are, but if you're not, let me get that link really quickly. Um, and you can subscribe to our emails about the Ada project specifically. If you would like to, there's the the form uh, for that. And my colleague, Martha Smith, will reach out to you and sign you up for all the marketing emails. And um, we have a monthly webinar, usually the second Tuesday of every month. Uh, so the April one is going to be a panel um, of autistic individuals or individuals with autism um, talking about being employed. So um, more information on that to come out. Just make sure you're signed up for those marketing emails if you are interested in that webinar as well. All right, I'll go ahead and close this out. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Have a great rest of your day. Hi, everyone. Thank you.